Thank you very much, uh, Frederick. Let me see if I can get my slides to go. Can you see them? Yes, we can. And you should now be full screen, is that correct? That is correct. Excellent. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, yes, Frederick has just reminded me we've known each other uh, in person for, for 20 years and uh, it's a great pleasure to um, to be talking to you today about my favourite topic. Uh, for the last 10 years I've been working as a, uh, an independent consultant. Uh, one of my affiliations uh, links in with this small UK charity. Um, and. I think it's fair to say that a lot of my thinking and my work still is very much focused on human drug induced liver injury, how we can manage it, um, how we can uh, develop drugs uh, that, that don't cause the problem or cause a minimum problem, and really what we can do to make sure that new drug candidates coming forward won't cause this issue uh, moving onwards. So, disclosure statement uh, I do get paid by. A number of different organizations uh, to work in the consultancy space and there's no doubt that drug induced liver injury uh, prediction assessment is a key driving force behind it um, so a full disclosure statement uh, I am definitely conflicted in the sense that I'm paid to work in this space however all views and opinions are my own based on my own personal experiences so you, you can um, take what you like uh, from that moving forward so what I'll focus on today is really uh, giving a personal perspective on this area uh, starting with the problem which I believe is really human idiosyncratic dilly um, how in vitro assays uh, can be selected and used uh, some examples of how they're being used um, how we can uh, draw a line of sight between these relatively simplified in vitro methods and mechanisms that actually apply in practice in real patients who, who develop problems. I'll talk about the thorny data interpretation problem and data integration um, issues, summarize everything and, and then give some personal perspectives on the way forward. Uh, one of the things I like very much about, uh, about drug induced liver injury is it's so complicated. I first started working on liver injury uh, a long, long time ago, uh, right at the beginning of my scientific career, and I've been obsessed by it ever since. And one of the things I like so much about it is that there's so much lack of consensus of the best way to, to manage and predict it. So that excites me, that motivates me, but to be honest, at my time of life, it's deeply frustrating. And I do think we need to do much better and move forward and stop talking about the problems and uh, be much clearer about what the solutions are. So, I, I, it's like Eskimos uh, being sold ice cream, me telling uh, the FDA that drug induced liver injury is a problem. You know it better than I do. It's an important uh, uh, cause of, of human illness, um, potentially fatal uh, liver failure, milder but still clinically concerning hepatitis cases, hospitalizations, and uh, continues to be an important cause of, uh, of failed licensing, limited drug use and withdrawal of licensed drugs. Now, with very, very few exceptions, I think acetaminophen would be the one standout um, illustration. Pretty well all of the drugs other than acetaminophen cause liver injury in some susceptible individuals, but most individuals dosed with the drug won't get liver injury and won't really get particularly severe symptoms. So it's called idiosyncratic, it arises in susceptible individuals. Many people still to this day, I think, are confusing idiosyncrasy with impossible to understand and, and manage. I don't think that's right. Idios idiosyncrasy simply means that there are uh, factors associated with the drug and factors associated with the individual uh, patient, which will determine whether or not the problem arises. So I personally believe that idiosyncrasy is something that can be understood and can be managed and can be predicted and largely avoided. And that's been, I guess, my mission for, for a number of decades now to, to try and work out how to do that. And one of the things that excites me a lot about this area is having worked as a toxicologist in industry for many years. I know that many scientists uh, focus on animal safety studies to pick up systemic toxicity is risks and particularly liver toxicity risks. And idiosyncratic human drug induced liver injury is, is very poorly uh, reproduced in animal safety studies. So really animal safety studies, I, I would argue, are a very limited value for, for drug induced liver injury. We need to think more creatively, more mechanistically. So 
uh, I didn't invent this kind of uh, simple cartoon illustration. I, I stole it uh, from, I think, Paul Watkins or others uh, many decades ago. It really highlights uh, this issue that uh, most patients who are uh, exposed to a drug that causes idiosyncratic drug-induced liver injury really won't have any significant problems at all. They'll tolerate the drug. Some patients will develop some mild liver injury which will resolve spontaneously itself, so-called adaptation, and it's only a small subset of the individuals who start to develop mild liver injury where the liver injury progresses and really results in a clinical manifestation. And often for the asyncratic daily, as you know better than I do, the frequency can be really very low. So this can be a real problem to pick up in drug development, even in quite large clinical trials. So it can be really a, quite a challenge to work out whether an individual drug taken into development really is causing idiosyncratic clinically concerning daily or not. But here's some examples of some drugs that have done that and have, have run into major problems uh, because of it. So I would argue that what we need to be doing is working out how we can uh, take drugs into development that really won't cause the susceptibility issue. So a number of uh, decades ago, a number of us thought that conceptually it might be feasible to look at in vitro methodologies, and I'll come back to the mechanistic rationale in a little while. We thought that conceptually it might be feasible to use in vitro methods to try and get some insights into uh, drug-induced liver injury mechanisms um, and to, to try and de-risk drugs. And uh, the idea is that if we can pick appropriate in vitro assays and we can qualify them in an appropriate way, we could maybe select between drugs that don't cause uh, drug-induced liver injury and pharmacologically very similar drugs that do cause drug-induced liver injury. When I first started out uh, my scientific career in liver injury, I, I was obsessed by halothane because in the clinical research unit I was working in at the time, it was the drug that was causing most cases of drug-induced liver injury. Uh, at one stage, it was uh, up in alongside um, acetaminophen in the UK in that uh, liver uh, in causing uh, uh, severe acute liver failure in patients we were seeing in that uh, uh, tertiary referral centre for drug induced liver injury. So I picked up on halothane and worked on halothane for very many years. So the concept is if we can use in vitro methods, we can understand enough about mechanisms, select the right in vitro assay, maybe we can uh, help to steer ourselves in the direction of selecting drugs that will go into development and will cause minor or, or no uh, concerning drug induced liver injury and avoid the catastrophe of tracking drugs into development that, that cause unexpected expected drug-induced liver injury. So in principle we're looking for de-risking strategies. Uh, I would also argue and I think everybody in, in the toxicological, toxicological community would agree that in vitro assays could be tremendously valuable in providing mechanistic insight. I think that's a given but the, the, the issue is can we actually use them to, to de-risk, predict and avoid drug-induced liver injury that might arise during a drug development. So we're really trying to um, distinguish between drugs with high uh, propensity to cause uh, clinically concerning uh, DILI in the human population versus drugs with much lower or no propensity to cause DILI in the human population. And some decades ago, when I first got excited by the concept, uh, this was a, almost a heretical uh, idea, but I think uh, as time has passed, it's becoming in increasingly accepted that actually this is a potential way forward, but we've just got to work out how to do it uh, systematically. Now, one thing that has changed a lot since I first got involved in the area is that we now understand that dose and clinical exposure is a really important risk factor. Looking back with the benefit of hindsight, it always was. Uh, high dose drugs, high exposure drugs are much more likely to cause uh, toxicological problems than low dose, low exposure drugs. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can use dose as a simplistic threshold and say, well, I'll just to develop a low dose drug and that won't cause uh, liver injury or that I shouldn't develop any medium or high dose drugs because they'll all cause drug induced liver injury. It's not a one to one correlation. But dose is important and this turns out to be very important when we're trying to uh, understand how to interpret in vitro assay data. So so called in vitro to in vivo extrapolation. Dose clinical exposure in the liver is really very important and we need to be able to work out how to do this. And 20 or 30 years ago, people weren't thinking enough about that. I certainly wasn't 20 years ago. But now it, I think most or everybody in the field would, would agree it's crucial. So we need to be able to work out how to do this. I'll come back to, to this in a little while. 
but we, we can't just rely on dose. We also need uh, some sort of model systems. And I would argue that uh, in vitro methods are models, just like uh, potential uh, animal uh, test studies are, are in vivo models. But with liver toxicity uh, models, we're talking about in vitro models if we're trying to go after humanized models. There are an enormous number of different varieties. Simple cell systems, HEP G2 cells, immortalized cell lines, fancy transfected cell lines, even membrane vesicles expressing uh, 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 components of interest like uh, biliary transporters. Relatively simple models, uh, a large number of those have been described. Also more sophisticated models have been described and I particularly like micro patterned uh, approaches which mix up hepatocytes with uh, supportive uh, stromal fibroblasts and other accessory cells because it appears that isolated hepatocytes left to their own in culture uh, aren't very happy and they lose metabolic capability and viability but uh, supportive cells help them to keep going, help to maintain differentiated uh, physiological functions. So these are intermediate type methods and a number of those have been described. And then more complex methods, liver spheroids, which have mul uh, hepatocytes and multiple cell types and can, and can be uh, maintained for multiple uh, days in, in vitro, have, have come on uh, particularly in the last uh, 10 years or so, but even 10 years ago they were starting to be described. And more, much more recently, bioreactors, liver bioreactors, physiologically relevant devices with multiple cell types, oxygen gradients, flow, uh, are starting to be described and have potential uh, possibly to, to give us some uh, really powerful new tools. Now, the reality is that if we're looking at complexity and cost, the simple systems, low complexity, low cost, are definitely the preferred way to go. If we're looking at sophistication, uh, uh, and physiological relevance, the more sophisticated uh, spheroid and bioreactor models are wonderful, but they've got high cost, they've got um, low throughput, high, turn, uh, low, high turnaround time. So really, if, if we're trying to look at how to select methods and use them in different phases uh, prior to clinical drug development, uh, up to licensing, we've really got a, a variety of different model systems and some tough decisions to take on which models to select and what to use when. And I would actually argue that all of these models have their potential value. We just need to work out how to use them and, and how to extract the maximum value of them. And for each of the model systems, we need to work out which really are providing the most robust and useful endpoints and which are largely redundant. In recent years, there's been a phenomenal interest in the more complex models and spheroids. And I'll start by talking about some of the data that's coming through from them, and then I'll backtrack to some of these other methods and, and give a personal perspective on, on why I think they're still valuable and, and, come, uh, and come on to how we can try and link things together subsequently. So this is one paper that I wasn't part of, so I'm very happy to, uh, to cite it, uh, which is a number of uh, collaborators from pharmaceutical companies, including my ex-colleague Alison Foster, who um, generated data with us a substantial number of different reference drugs, some of which caused DILI, some of which did not cause DILI in humans. And they were looking at uh, primary cultured human hepatocytes and liver spheroids and asking and, and looking at, at simple cytotoxicity endpoints and asking how useful could these methods be at, uh, at, predict, at, at picking up toxicity that can differentiate between uh, drugs that cause DILI and drugs that don't cause DILI. Now this is quite a complicated slide, I won't try and explain it in detail, but the point, one essential point, uh, back to the exposure business, in order to make sense of these data, they considered it was vitally important to compare the potency in vitro of, of drugs in causing cytotoxicity in their cell systems with in vivo drug exposure. And they went for total plasma Cmax, as many people have done, because it's a parameter that uh, you can derive uh, and get robust values for. And this is an a sort of a, a secondary surrogate index of uh, what we hope drug exposure within liver cells will be. It's not the same as drug exposure within liver cells, but at least it's an indicator which, which is closer than, than looking at dose. So uh, they derived uh, ratios between IC50 and Cmax and that then came up with these uh, margins of safety threshold here. And depending on the margin of safety threshold, uh, you, you you lose specificity as you increase the margin of safety, but you increase sensitivity. Now, the bottom line conclusion from this study was that liver spheroids performed markedly better than primary human hepatocytes. Uh, 
you see about 60% maximum sensitivity at their 100-fold margin of safety and about 80% 80, 80 sensitivity versus 40% sensitivity, 85% specificity for primary human hepatocytes. So that, their argument was that, uh, that liver spheroids uh, would be the preferred methodology uh, moving forward if you're trying to select a simple uh, a, a complex cell type to work with or a cell type to work with and generate cytotoxicity data that can be informative for drug induced liver injury risk and i've seen a number of other uh, publications which have concluded much the same thing and this is one that i like very much so um, you can see here another publication from a different group of investigators uh, a couple of years ago, they looked at 70 drugs, uh, uh, 70 drugs that caused DILI, 53 that didn't cause DILI, and if they used uh, their margin of, uh, of safety of about 20-fold, uh, they, they came up with a DILI sensitivity of about 69%, and really good specificity, so the DILI negatives weren't giving signals on these assays. So I think this is nice. Uh, I won't bother uh, going through the rest of the complexity of, of this slide. This is nice, but it only gets you so far. A maximum DILI sensitivity of about 70%. And with the best will in the world, even with a, a really sophisticated uh, um, in vitro model system like a liver spheroid, uh, you can't get higher than about 70% uh, DILI uh, sensitivity. And another article has attempted, to, sorry, the same article as the, as the previous one, I think, attempted to compare the performance of lots of, of different assays. And you can see that uh, people have uh, tested different numbers of, of test drugs, not extraordinarily high numbers, but some quite respectable numbers. And you see that the, the sensitivity and specificity, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's no higher than um, just below 70%. This is about as good as you'll get with uh, even a sophisticated uh, um, liver spheroid model. Now, I haven't seen an equivalent set of data with uh, a microphysiologic uh, cell device yet. Uh, my gut feel is that probably the data will come out very similar. From what I've seen published on uh, microphysiologic liver devices, they don't seem to be outperforming liver spheroids at the present time. So I think if you just rely on those kind of, uh, of, of approaches, that's as far as you can get. So in the previous slide, there was a nice table trying to compare different uh, assay methods and look at uh, specificity and sensitivity of different assay methods. And di uh, different numbers of drugs have been um, used in those studies. One of the problems that's been afflicting this field all the way through up to the present day is inconsistent DILI annotation. We would like to have an agreed way to classify whether or not a drug causes uh, clinically concerning drug induced liver injury and what level of concern we give to it. And when I first started out in this field, trying to write up manuscripts 20 years ago, I was scratching my head or even trying to design studies 20 years ago because I couldn't find any systematic way that uh, this has been described. So Minjun, congratulations. You've got together with some colleagues. You've come up with, uh, with, with a variety of ranking tools. I like this very much. Um, I know it's not perfect, but I think this idea of most versus less versus no dilly concern and ambiguous dilly concern is as good as we can get at the same time and is a really big step forward. Uh, you've looked at uh, FDA approved drug labels. You looked at causality evidence published in the literature. That's the best you can do. And I think this is a, a wonderful uh, way forward. And I would argue that everybody in the field should be starting from this classification moving onwards. And I just wish that I'd had this available when I started in the field. And I wish that everybody trying to publish at the present time would use this as a baseline classification. You can always bring in your own tweaks on top of it, but I would like every comparative Dilly prediction uh, paper using an in, in vitro method from now onwards to use this as a baseline. And I would urge that that's absolutely essential. Otherwise, we'll continue to, to talk about uh, conflicting data sets. Another problem is I'd like us to agree on which of the drugs we're actually going to use. And I would argue 192 most dilly concerned drugs, 278 less concern, 312 no dilly concern. You know, let's use this as, as the baseline and, and see what we can do moving onwards. Anyway, what else can we do? Uh, I've waited to now to bring in mechanisms. I'm a, a biochemical toxicologist at heart, and this is a relatively simple cartoon summary of my view of how human DILI mechanisms arise. And the first thing is the drug has to get into uh, liver cells. 
nearly all drugs that cause clinical concern liver injury it's, it's the hepatocyte that's the primary cell type you need to worry about so i would argue go for the hepatocytes and worry about other things subsequently so the drug has to get into the hepatocyte and then it's got to trigger biological processes in hepatocytes that lead to cell stress and that can either damage cells directly or can trigger trigger off uh um, downstream interaction with, with immune responses um, and, and, and cause adaptive immunity uh, related liver injury and severe liver injury caused by drugs I would argue is, is a combination of, of both methods there are some drugs where adaptive immunity seems to be overwhelming import, overwhelmingly important like halothane but for most drugs I think it's a bit of a mixture of both and we really don't know how many for how many drugs adaptive immunity really is very important so adaptive immunity is very difficult to, to study but the ways in which drugs can mess with biological functions in the liver actually is amenable to study. And to start off with, we weren't sure how many mechanisms we'd need to worry about. I would argue we, there's probably three big things we would need to worry about at the present time. If you're concerned about reactor metabolites and you can quantify that well, I think that's a good starting point. Uh, in the last 20 years, it's become clear that BCEP inhibition is important. So you need to be asking whether a drug will inhibit, uh, the, bar, inhibit the activity of the bile salt export pump and lead to accumulation within cells of bile acids, which can cause mitochondrial injury and damage cells that way. Or some drugs can directly damage mitochondria or directly cause cell stress processes. I would argue if you go after reactor metabolites, mitochondrial injury, BCEP inhibition, you, you're a long way there. And this is was my thinking when I first got into the in vitro uh, Dilly uh, predictive area. How can we go after this very effectively? And my argument was, well, let's not worry about the finer points of tolerance, adaptation and susceptibility factors. These are really very difficult. Maybe if we go after this, this is sufficient for de-risking purposes uh, prior to taking uh, drug candidates into drug development. So if you follow that, uh, that logic, you've then got to work out, right, what assays do you pick and what endpoints do you pick? And actually the assays you pick could be somewhat simpler than going for sophisticated models like liver spheroids and can be somewhat simpler than, than going after microphysiologic cell devices. I would argue since um, I'm concerned about damage to hepatocytes, cell cytotoxicity is a useful parameter. I would argue BCEP inhibition can be a useful parameter. Inhibition of mitochondrial function, let's worry about that as well. And let's also not overlook reactor metabolite formation because this is the predominant way that you can uh, trigger drug, drug captain induced immune responses of the type that halothane uh, can trigger off. And covalent binding to proteins is a quantifiable index there. We've been able to do this for decades. So, okay, where's the field got with this? Well, Ryan Morgan and his colleagues were the first people to, to provide hard evidence in the literature indicating that BCEP inhibition was associated with drug-induced liver injury risk. And at the same time, my uh, colleagues and I and AstraZeneca were, were developing a data set, not as many drugs, but uh, we were frustrated that Morgan, uh, that Ryan Morgan beat us to the punch in publication, but we came in a bit later and uh, this was our, fub our first publication in this space. And really, we, we're, again, we're using this in a comparison between potency of, of a drug um, against BCEP and plasma Cmax. And if you work out a ratio, you can get a really nice distinction between quite a number of drugs that, uh, that cause uh, clinically concerning drug-induced liver injury and drugs that don't, don't cause clinically concerning drug-induced liver injury. And I'm delighted that, uh, that now I think it's widely accepted and there's lots more publications that have come forward documenting the fact that, that BCEP really does appear to be a delirious factor. And we can detect this relatively easily using uh, simple membrane musical assays. Mitochondrial impairment uh, is, is a, a bit fiddlier to, to assess. Uh, the uh, so-called Crabtree effect assay where you compare cytotoxicity in glucose versus galactose medium is one way that you can pick up some drugs that, that impair mitochondrial function, but only some of the mechanisms. The Seahorse assay, uh, a proprietary platform, which can uh, measure oxygen consumption and look at the effects of, uh, of perturbing drugs and tease out different components of mitochondrial respiration is definitely the Rolls-Royce way to look at mitochondrial dysfunction. And a number of people have been starting to, uh, to publish data on this. And it's, it's definitely clear, I, I would argue, that quite a number of drugs that cause clinical concerning DILI uh, are causing mitochondrial uh, impairment at what we think uh, are, 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 are relevant uh, in vitro um, uh, uh, 
concentrations of drugs. I don't have a, a nice set of data because I've not been able to pull out a nice set of data, but I think there is some data that's, that's coming through the literature indicating mitochondrial impairment is a real contender uh, for our, our assay panel. Chemical reactor metabolites, uh, we've known for a long time, are an important trigger for dose-dependent DILI, with acetaminophen being um, everybody's favorite poster child. We've also known for a long time that it's a prerequisite of metabolite haptin-induced adaptive immune responses of the type uh, that halothane triggers. And I think it, it's now recognized that, that uh, chemical reactor metabolite formation, which can be quantified by looking at covalent binding to, to protein, is also a risk factor for the syncretic uh, DILI. This is the, the Nakayama et al. paper uh, from uh, a Japanese group that first excited me about the, the, the methodology in um, human hepatocytes exposed to radio-labeled drugs. And if you compare daily dose of drug with, uh, with quantifiable covenant binding, you can pull apart different risk groups for clinically concerning serious adverse reactions associated uh, with reactive metabolite formation. Uh, mostly drug-induced liver injury, although immune hypersensitivity reactions, uh, uh, which, which can affect the skin or systemic immunity rather than the liver, are, are also picked up by this kind of methodology. And this is the, the data set that my colleagues and I in, in AstraZeneca generated following on from this. We were able to get a partial zonal separation. But to be honest, we were quite frustrated that when we looked at reactive metabolite formation in isolation and we compared with, with daily dose of drugs, we simply weren't getting a good enough uh, separation. So, which suggested to us it was a risk factor, but not good enough in itself. So something else that you can do, reactive metabolite formation can be quantified by, by looking at bioactivation and covenant binding, is, is actually to look at differential toxicity in cells expressing drug metabolizing enzymes versus cells not expressing drug metabolizing enzymes. So Frederick Moulin introduced me to the THLE cell lines. So he and his colleagues published on this before I did. Uh, this is... A, um, an immortalized uh, hepatocyte derived stable cell line that has no P450 activity at all to start off with. It can be stably transfected with a variety of human P450s to get high levels of expression, which are in, in, in line with what you get with human hepatocytes. And then you can compare toxicity of your test drug against the P450 expressing cells versus the mock transfected cells and ask, do you get a differential? And if you get potentiation in the SIP expressing cells, then you get evidence of metabolite driven toxicity. And if you get um, uh, less toxicity in the, sorry, in the P450 expressing cells, uh, how do I go backwards previous? If you get less toxicity in the P450 expressing cells, it's evidence of metabolic detoxification. This is some of the data that my, pub, my, my colleagues and I published uh, attempting to use this kind of methodology. To be honest, I would argue that, that Frederick knows this area more than I do, and uh, I'm really excited that he introduced me to the cell system. I do think that it's been underutilized. Um, others haven't picked up on this cell system as much as I think they should have. It's a really powerful way to tease out the role of metabolism in toxicity. And this is a mechanistic uh, study we, we published a number of years ago where we were able to document that cell cytotoxicity of Romanabant is a very potent uh, uh, cytotoxin to cells expressing CYP3A4. And this is because of bioactivation of the drug Romanabant to a hard electrophile that covalently binds to extraordinarily high levels to, uh, to uh, cell proteins. And if you block um, CYP3A4 activity by using ritonavir, you block this potentiation of activity and you also block the covalent binding and you also block the formation of the, the hard electrophile aluminium ion. So it's a really powerful mechanistic tool. And it's another way that you can tease apart this problem of reactive metabolite associated uh, cell toxicity. So, I put this slide up not because I'm trying to suggest that this is the best way to do it, but this is one attempt by myself and a number of colleagues to ask, well, how can we try and integrate multiple endpoints, multiple mechanistic endpoints in some kind of way to try and get an aggregate index of, uh, of in vitro DILI risk? And we had covalent binding as, a, of our, as our index of metabolite mediated toxicity, and we picked uh, several indices of non-metabolite mediated toxicity, BCEP inhibition, MRP2 inhibition. Uh, we ran it at the time because we thought it could be helpful. Actually, if I were doing this study again, I'd drop it. Uh, we had potentiated toxicity uh, in, in HEPG2 
two cells in glucose galactose medium. If I was doing this again, I'd drop this assay and use seahorse, and we had our THLE assay data in THLE expressing cell lines and CIP expressing cell lines. And we aim to aggregate everything together by undertaking a, a dose adjustment of the covalent binding data and also by using binary scores for whether or not the, the potency of effect in these vitro, in vitro assays were above and below a threshold. And at the time, it seemed to us like a way to try and aggregate data. I was quite proud of this analysis at the time. I'm putting it up now, to be honest, to hold my hand up and say that with a better of hindsight, I'm somewhat embarrassed about it. This binary score, IC50 threshold, doesn't take account of in vivo drug exposure. You know, that's actually wrong. We should have undertaken an exposure adjustment of this score and we should have thought more carefully about the endpoints to select. So if we were starting again, I do it somewhat differently, but I think the overall philosophy I'm still quite proud of. And the key thing is that it was a way to try and aggregate multiple data types and to uh, subdivide into four so-called zones where you've got uh, different types of uh, either no concern, no in vitro signal, high concern, you've got signals in, uh, in multiple uh, assays, uh, including covalent binding, and you've also got signals in fewer assays with and without covalent binding, or covalent binding, you know, without assay signals, if you like. So I'm somewhat disappointed that others haven't picked up on this. To be honest, it's so complicated and it was such a head scratcher to do it. I'm actually now unsurprised that it's not been picked up and run with by other individuals. It's just too complicated. I think if you know what you're doing, you can make it work. But 10 years on, it's not been picked up by others. So I've got to accept that it was a nice idea at the time, but we need to find an alternative way of doing things. We did actually subsequently run through three drugs, which we didn't test in the original panel, just to ask if we pick this additional drug series up and we, we run it through the panel, what kind of uh, 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 assay uh, data would we get? And, and could we actually uh, qualify the panel by using an independent set of data compared to the, the, the set of compounds that we used in, in evaluating the panel? So this is uh, three endothelium receptor antagonists, one very nasty, one not, not ideal and one really nice drug. And we asked whether the ha hazard matrix could do a good job. And we got some quite nice data on the original ha hazard matrix indicating our nasty drug was hitting pretty well everything that we could think of. And our safe drug was really not doing very much at all. And we came up with the, with the panel uh, in, in our original non-dose adjusted way of, of evaluating the in vitro assay signals. And we, we published that and as a, a validation of the panel. But the reason I'm putting this uh, example up is we, we undertook this analysis a few years after we described our original uh, matrix. And by that time, we thought our way through, there must be an exposure adjusted way of evaluating the in vitro assay data. So we were looking at uh, Cmax divided by in vitro IC50. And if we did that, it, we got an even better classification because we found that Cetaxentan, the drug that uh, caused fatal liver failure and was withdrawn, uh, really was a very bad actor and never, clearly never should have gone into development if we had these kind of data. Bezentan, which is, is not ideal, it is associated with liver injury, but not as bad as Cetaxentan, actually is safer and Ambrosentan are widely used drugs which started out with a cautionary label because it was in the dr same drug class as Bezentan and Cetaxentan actually is remarkably clean and clinically it's turned out to be a, a very safe and effective endothelium receptor and antagonist. So I'm putting this up to indicate that uh, actually we learned from this and if we were starting again we'd use an exposure adjusted um, aggregated safety score but in practice I think it's still probably too complicated and others haven't picked up with it, picked up on it. There are other multi-parametric data analysis strategies that, that others have described, and I haven't got time to go through them in detail, but I've just picked up three examples of simpler um, strategies, which I like very much. So the, the Pfizer strategy, strategy that Mike Ali, Alio and colleagues um, published, where they were talking about uh, looking at cell cytotoxicity in combination with BSEP inhibition, in combination with, uh, with exposure, you know, the, the philosophy that, I, that I've been describing. You know, I like that, that very much. And Mike and I uh, exchanged a lot of ideas and have collaborated on various articles and basically and agreed that uh, you know, if we were doing things, uh, we very much would have joined forces and come up with a, with a smart and lean way of doing things. Melanie Sicatis and colleagues at GSK have had an even stripped down strategy looking at uh, cytotoxicity to, to HG2 cells 
in combination with a non-quantitative -quant index of, uh, of bioactivation in combination with drug dose, which seems to be a, a pretty good preclinical strategy for them in GSK. And, uh, and Rob Ucher has uh, talked about uh, using uh, BCEP inhibition in, in combination with, with physical chemical properties. So there are other flavors. And in my time of consultant, uh, as a consultant, I've been approached by a number of organizations asking how can they design preclinical DILI strategies. And I, I'm delighted that uh, as far as I'm aware, all of the big player companies in this space are developing their own strategies. I wish they'd be more open about it and I wish they'd, they'd swap notes because I think they could very much uh, move forward better if everybody really would act in, in a proper collegiate way moving onwards. But life is what it is. So I've just got uh, one slide talking about PBPK based modelling and I have been a, a consultant for the Dillison Consortium and when I was in AstraZeneca I convinced our senior management to give uh, Paul Watkins and his colleagues some money to get Dilly Sim Consortium off the ground. So I'm, a, I'm conflicted on this. And one thing I'm very proud of is that um, I managed to convince our senior management and safety assessment to fund the Dilly Sim work on using PBPK modeling, to PBPK based modeling to help interpret um, in vitro uh, Dilly risk uh, methodology. I managed to convince our senior management to fund this work in spite of the fact that pathologists tried to argue it was never going to work and it was a stupid idea. So I'm delighted about that because I think it has worked and I'm delighted that the FDA have been one of the, the groups that have been involved in this area and I know that they've had people working directly with, with Dilisim. And this is just one example of uh, using this Dilisim approach to integrate multiple in vitro parameters rather than doing the, the very um, rather poor amateurish um, aggregation of data that my colleagues and I undertook. They, they basically use PBPK modeling and um, um, a much more sophisticated analysis of, uh, of, of in vitro uh, methodology from several in vitro assays. And because they use this PBPK based modeling approach and they've got something called SIMPOPs where you can bring some individual jitter and variability into this, they can simulate variability in response across simulated populations. And they've done this in animals and they've done this in humans. Uh, using real PBPK based uh, uh, data and one of the th things I like very much about this particular slide is, is it highlights a very nice match between their simulations for um, ALT changes uh, caused by triglitazone as simulated by their model and actual ALT elevations seen in clinical trials uh, with, with uh, uh, triglitazone. They've got a, a similar frequency of effects and a similar uh, duration of uh, delayed duration of effect. So it's really quite spectacular um, how successful this has been. I would not argue that it, it'll solve all problems, but I, I, I firmly believe that this is the Rolls-Royce approach and this is the way forward for sophisticated uh, interpretation of, of in vitro Dilly data. We've just got to work out which data. And uh, the Dilly Sim team, uh, much to Paul Watkins' surprise, discovered that BCEP inhibition is really very important for at least some drugs. And they clearly highlighted that the mechanism of BCEP inhibition is very important which I hadn't properly appreciated. So mixed competitive, non-competitive, rather, comp rather than competitive mechanisms. And they've also got a number of examples where, where mitochondrial inhibition has turned out to be very important. So anyway, Diddy Sim um, can, can talk for themselves about the work they're doing. I'm a, I'm a fan of, of, uh, of their uh, work, as you can tell. It won't solve all problems, but I, I think it's, it's, it's an essential part of where we're going moving forward. So, to summarise, uh, there are many different in vitro assays that can be used. Uh, I would argue that uh, although it's quite difficult to, to compare and contrast between them, all of them, appear every, pretty well every published article I've read on in vitro assays where somebody has taken the trouble to generate a, a good data set with good quality and carefully selected assays, all of them have been, been more useful at uh, discriminating between DILI and non-DILI drugs uh, than animal safety studies. The in vitro assays are all focused on DILI initiating mechanisms and, and resulting hepatocellular events, not after human susceptibility factors. So these assess human population DILI risk, not risk in individual humans. You know, the, the best uh, simulations are the DILI sim simulations in terms of trying to get to variable uh, risk across populations. But using these methods at the moment, we can't get to risk in, in to, to risk in individual humans. We're talking about Dilly propensity in uh, in human populations. 
when we use in vitro assay potency and we analyze this alongside in vivo drug exposure, we can, we can achieve good DILI specificity. Plasma CMAX is the most commonly used parameter. PBPK based simulations uh, are ideal, were feasible, and they're a much better way of uh, assessing exposure and, and liver exposure. Now, total plasma CMAX, I've got to say, is suboptimal. We really should be looking at unbound uh, concentrations of drugs or concerning metabolites within liver cells. But we really don't know how to do that very well or how to assess or predict that very well. So total plasma CMAX is a surrogate. It's not ideal, but it's where we are at the present time. As I've tried to, uh, um, to argue and show data on, I don't believe there's any single in vitro method that will give us more than 70% DILI, DILI sensitivity. So even a, a, a sophisticated uh, device like a liver spheroid, at maximum you'll get 70% DILI sensitivity. So you need to have multiple mechanisms to complement this and you need to work out how to integrate multiple mechanisms to achieve uh, high daily sensitivity and a number of people are trying to do this but at this time of my life uh, I'm rather frustrated that we haven't reached consensus on the best way to go about this and one thing that really does frustrate me a lot continuously is the comparison between the different proposed assay options is I think more difficult than it ought to be and I think that there are smarter ways to work moving forwards. In terms of what the future needs to look like, and I believe will look like, we desperately need to reach consensus on which in vitro assays should, we should be losing, using sooner rather than later. And we should be selecting different types of assays for high throughput routine use at different phases of drug discovery, compared to the kind of assays we might use before drug licensing to properly assess DILI risk, or the kind of drugs we might use before deciding whether or not a drug is safe enough to go, to go into um, non-clinical uh, to into clinical drug development in clinical trials. So if, if the, there are efforts underway to deal with this, um, I think they're moving too slowly. We need to accelerate this. We also need to standardize assay data generation data analysis methodologies. I recently saw a nice paper coming out for a number of, of, of groups talking about how to standardize uh, liver spheroid uh, and, and other microphysiologic type methods. I think that's a good step forward. But data analysis, I think we've got to do better at that. I, I would argue that how to assess and predict drug concentrations within human liver cells in vivo, for me, is one of the biggest challenge. We've got to get better at doing this. I think using modern methodologies, it ought to be feasible and sophisticated PBPK based modeling approaches ought to make this uh, much more realistic uh, than, than it is routinely at the moment. And I expect a lot of progress in this in coming years. And I would argue because we want to get to high specificity, we've got to be able to integrate multiple mechanisms. So I've talked about some of the challenges and given some suggestions on where we are at the moment. I think we will do better than this in the future, particularly using PBPK based simulation type approaches. I would argue that a massive opportunity is, is not to stop with in vitro, uh, but actually, uh, sorry, that should have been, uh, we've also got to be thinking of um, how we can integrate in vitro within silico tools. Some people are starting to do that. I know that Minjan and others are, are publishing on in silico tools, and I've been um, doing some stuff on this in the background as well. In silico tools integrated with in vitro, definitely we're very powerful. And I think integrating the outputs from in vitro and in silico tools with in vivo functional biomarkers will, will be tremendously valuable for in vitro to in vivo extrapolation. So some of the work I'm doing with, uh, with a, a, a European funded Tristan consortium is looking at bar flow imaging as a way to try and quantify in vivo perturbations by drugs that inhibit BCEP, uh, in, inhibit the BCEP transporter, for example. Uh, downstream, we've got to bring in in vivo susceptibility factors, and I think disease state genetics, HLA haplotype, so on and so forth, are really powerful opportunities. Um, to, to think really blue skies, um, I've never liked the idea of working on DILI in isolation from other systemic toxicity effects, and I think we're well past the time we should be integrating together at least some of the mechanisms, uh, methods that we're using to evaluate DILI in vitro with methods that have been developed by others to look at other um, systemic toxicity endpoints. There's some overlap with some of the cardiotoxicity parameters. If you damage cardiac cells, then uh, mitochondrial injury could be important. So, you know, there's possible overlap there. And definitely for immune hypersensitivity, covalent binding is really very important. And development reproductive toxicology. Well, you know, how can we think holistically and, and not make life too complicated. Can we simplify it down? 
And I suspect we probably can, but we need to have more dialogue between people working on in these individual areas. Um, I suppose as an ex-industry person, I'm a bit heretical. I would like to have seen stronger regulatory guidelines at least 10 years ago. And I think it's well past time we should have stronger regulatory guidelines requiring use of in vitro uh, DILI methods to, to support DILI risk assessment. And I would like that to be starting right now. And I, I would like us to focus much more on developing that in the future. So I will stop there. I hope I haven't spoken too long and I've left a minute or two at least for, for questions and answers. And from this cartoon, I hope you can tell which of these two individuals I am. Thanks for your attention, everybody.